Welcome to the last video of Unit 7. Unit 7 is Natural Selection, and this video, Video 5, covers phylogeny, speciation, and extinction. So phylogeny is examining the relationship between lineages. So for example, looking at the evolution of species within um, a related group of species. Cladograms and phylogenetic trees are two ways that we can visually represent those relationships. On the top, you'll see a cladogram. On the bottom left, a phylogenetic tree. What's the difference between these? In a cladogram, the length of the branches is arbitrary, whereas in a phylogenetic tree, the length of the branches has meaning. Usually, the length of branches corresponds to um, a certain amount of time. For example, on the phylogenetic tree on the bottom left, you can see that the common ancestor of C and D was more recent than the common ancestor of A and B whereas that type of information is not captured in a cladogram. So how do you read a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram? A couple of terms that are important to know, or just an overall view of, of what we're looking at. Keep in mind that the ancestors are at sort of the root side of things, um, and usually that's shown on the left, although not always. Um, it can also be on the bottom. You really could put it anywhere, but generally the root is on the bottom or the left. That's where the ancestral group is. The present day species are shown as sort of the, the tips of the branches. So in this case, we have A, B, C, D, and E. Most recent ancestors are shown where two groups come together. So the most recent ancestor of A and B is shown in that um, dot, that node in the upper right. Whereas closer to the root, you can see the most recent ancestor of A, B, C, D, and E. Another term that you should be familiar with is outgroup. Outgroup represents a lineage that is the least closely related to the other taxa. It's used as a comparison group. So it's saying, all right, here's something that's very different. Um, these traits, if there's traits in common between, for example, E and also between A, B, C, D, those are very ancestral. Those would um, be traits found all the way back at that very far away common ancestor showed by that leftmost node. Something important to notice is that the branches of trees can be rotated. So it's actually easier to think about these as 3D structures that we're just capturing a temporary 2D version of. So if you think about um, all of these branches can spin on the nodes. So for example, if we spun that phylogenetic tree shown on the upper left, um, we would then end up with exactly the same relationship between groupings, just visualized a different way. So to help practice this, what group or groups are most closely related to X? The groups most closely related to X are both Y and Z. And you can see that the way to do this is to go back to the most recent divergence, so go back to the most recent node, and then follow that branch up the other path and see what organisms or um, groups you run into. All trees are visual hypotheses. So these are not necessarily things that we know absolutely for sure, but we're trying to puzzle through this based on the data that we have. So they are constantly revised as we get more data. What types of data can be used to construct cladograms and phylogenetic trees? One type of information is morphological traits. So morphological traits are kind of like thinking about it, the shape, so the physical traits of um, an organism. You can also include um, anatomy or, sorry, physiology and behavior in that. But generally, it's going to be things that we can um, look at. You can dissect or you can look at fossil evidence and see. Um, and these are traits that can be gained or lost during evolution. So for example, some of the traits that we are seeing on this uh, cladogram are a vertebral column, hinged jaws, four walking legs, amnion, and hair. And so any groups that come, that branch after that point where that trait is shown will have that trait. Generally, shared characteristics indicate common ancestry, which is why this kind of technique works, but we have to be careful because this isn't always true. When do we have shared characteristics that are not indicative of common ancestry? That would be when we see convergent evolution. 
So for example, a shark and a dolphin have some similarities in their structure, in their behavior, in their physiology, um, because they share selection pressures, because they both live in aquatic environments. This is not because they are most closely related. So you can see on this tree, the traits that do define the um, relationships are ones that um, you are took place during evolution. Um, then sometimes you have on that dolphin branch and on that shark branch, independently, they'll start evolving traits that fit their shared common um, environment. But that does not imply that they are closely related. Another way that we can develop trees is based on molecular data. And that includes similarities in molecules such as DNA, RNA, and proteins. So what we see on the left is a complicated tree, but this is actually looking at the coronavirus. So it's looking at um, almost 4,000 genomes that were sampled between December 2019 and March 2021. And then you can start seeing um, the, the branching patterns of looking at different strains, when and where they evolved. And this can help scientists and epidemiologists track the movement of viruses around the globe and can help control the spread. Generally, molecular data is more accurate and reliable than morphological traits. Now we're going to move into 7.10, which is looking at speciation. Evolution causes changes in a population, and this can be true of all different mechanisms of evolution. Remember, there are five different mechanisms of evolution. So technically, all of those can lead to speciation, but we're going to focus on natural selection here. So looking at this diagram, I want you to describe how the type of selection pressure might influence how a trait changes. So how might the phenotype, in this case fur color, how might selection pressures influence fur color in different ways? So you can see three different types of selection here, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. In stabilizing selection, the, um, the sort of the average or the, the, the fur color in the middle is uh, most advantageous, where there is a decrease, those arrows are showing where the decreased fitness levels are. So uh, species, or sorry, the, the mice that have the fur that is um, too light or too dark, um, those both have lower fitness in that environment or at that time. That's going to cause stabilizing selection. If instead we look in the middle, this is directional selection, where it's just that light colored fur is um, a lower fitness. That's going to shift the overall distribution and favor one extreme. Disruptive selection is where you have lower fitness of the, the, the phenotype in the, in the middle. So in this case, the sort of medium coat color is less, um, less fit, whereas the lighter coat and the darker coat have higher fitness. A couple of questions related to this is, what is a species? If we're talking about speciation, we should probably figure out what a species is. And then looking at these diagrams, are all types of selection equally likely to result in speciation? A species is defined as a group capable of interbreeding and exchanging genetic information to produce viable fertile offspring. There are different types of selection that can lead to speciation of one species becoming multiple species. One would be disruptive, where you get a real difference by modal distribution, so big differences within, a, within one population, what starts as one population, becoming two populations that no longer interbreed with each other. Another possibility is if the populations are already in two environments, you can have different selection pressures that cause differential directional selection. So you might have two islands, for example, and if there are different pressures on those two islands, um, you would have one species changing in one way, one species changing in a different way, or I should say populations. One population changing in one way, one population changing in another. And eventually, if they start changing enough, they might become species that can no longer interbreed. It's important to point out that populations are not going to speciate unless there's a disruption to interbreeding that results in viable fertile offspring. And this comes back to the definition of a species. If a species is a group that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, in order to get speciation, something there must disrupt that process. What might disrupt that process? So this process can be disrupted along any point in the process of interbreeding or producing viable fertile offspring. We generally group this into two categories of prezygotic versus postzygotic barriers. 
Remember that a zygote is the fertilized egg, so that's the very beginning of when the um, two uh, genetic informations of the parents came together, the two gametes come together. So examples of prezygotic barriers would be if they're isolated habitats, temp temporal would be with time, behavioral is that there's um, a difference in uh, behavior that keeps the populations apart so much that they turn into two species. Um, if a mating attempt does occur, maybe it physically doesn't work. There's mechanical isolation. Or maybe it physically works, but once the gametes um, are together, they don't actually cause fertilization. That's gamete level isolation. If fertilization does occur, then you still might have a disruption if it's a post-zygotic. So this would disrupt the formation of a viable fertile offspring. Sometimes it's that the offspring produced are not viable, so that they have a much lower um, fitness and they just don't survive. Or perhaps they survive, but they're not fertile. We'll talk about this example in a moment. Um, it could also be that they produce offspring, but those offspring break down. So as you can see, you can get this breakdown of interbreeding and production of viable fertile offspring at any point along the way. Let's go into a couple of examples to make sure you understand this in a little bit more detail. So an example of a prezygotic barrier is blue-footed boobies do elaborate courtship dances. Closely related species have different dances which prevents interbreeding. So even if the gametes were able to combine in a lab setting, they don't interbreed because of this specialized behavior. This is a prezygotic barrier where those gametes never come together. An example of a postzygotic barrier are mules. So horses and donkeys can interbreed and can produce offspring, but those offspring are not fertile. So they're viable, they can live, these are mules, but they're not fertile, they can't reproduce. And the reason in this case um, is the um, amount of genetic information. So horses, um, diploid horses are 64 chromosomes, donkeys diploid are 62. Both of those work perfectly well um, if donkeys breed with donkeys, if horses breed with horses. But when a donkey breeds with a horse, you end up with a mule where the 2N is 63. And that's not going to work in terms of producing a viable gamete. So let's go on and talk about speciation in terms of sort of where it can occur. So we're no longer talking about prezygotic versus postzygotic. Here we're looking kind of at geography, essentially. So based on this diagram, what's the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation? Allopatric speciation is where the speciation happens where the populations are in different areas. Maybe you have a big geographical barrier, like a river or a um, canyon, separating, or even an ocean, separating the two populations. That would be allopatric. Whereas sympatric is the speciation happens in the same place, so they're not physically separated from each other. Another question is, the, is the rate of speciation consistent? So over evolutionary time, do we have the generation of new species at a constant rate? There are actually two different um, sort of theories here, or I shouldn't say theory, but there are two different models. Um, one is gradualism, and one is punctuated equilibrium. So gradualism, the idea is that, yes, it's fairly consistent. Species uh, descend from a common ancestor, gradually diverge. Whereas punctuated equilibrium model is saying that, no, there is sort of fits and spurts where there is a period where things stay the same, and then there's some um, big event and you get a big change. As is often true in academic arguments, um, the answer is that both happen. So um, the rate of evolution is sometimes consistent, gradualism, and it sometimes occurs in bursts, which is punctuated equilibrium. Let's look more at that punctuated equilibrium. What might lead to rapid speciation? One of the most common causes of rapid speciation is when new habitats become available. So for example, um, birds finding a new island, like in the Galapagos with the finches, um, when a bird or a small group of birds reaches a new island, ra adaptive radiation and rapid speciation can take place. There are so many different sort of available niches in the um, environment that these birds can adapt to fill all of these different roles in the ecology. 
So we've talked about um, speciation, formation of new species, but the other side of this is extinction, where species um, die off. What causes extinction? Extinction occurs when a species is unable to adapt quickly enough to environmental changes. A couple of very common factors that lead to extinction are habitat loss, as pictured in the upper left, invasive species, this is a lionfish. Um, invasive species can be detrimental to different uh, other species in the um, area because maybe the invasive species is a new predator um, or maybe it's a new co competitor. So it can have an impact on the entire ecology of the, of the area. And then climate change is another factor that can cause um, extinction. What is it that makes a population more vulnerable to extinction? Generally, populations with low genetic diversity are less able to adapt and less resistant to disease. If you remember that natural selection can only work on available variation. So if a population has very little diversity, there is less room, there's less area for, for natural selection to act. This is related to something called the extinction vortex, whereas if you have a small population, then there are factors such as inbreeding, random genetic drift, both lead to a loss of genetic variability, which can then reduce fitness, which can then lower reproduction, which can create an even smaller population. So this is a sort of bad kind of a positive feedback cycle. And humans are working with cheetahs, for example, that have very low genetic diversity to work on finding ways um, to help the population, to both increase the population in terms of numbers, but also in terms of genetic variability, of doing genetic studies on the cheetahs that are remaining and doing um, breeding in zoos and in facilities to try to maintain and increase that genetic variability. So humans are a big problem in terms of extinction. Many people refer to the sixth mass extinction as human driven. And this is partly because extinction occurs when a species is unable to adapt quickly enough to environmental changes. Humans are really good at causing rapid environmental change. But this also sort of gives us hope in the sense that we don't have to completely stop the changes that we are um, causing on the, on the environment. If we manage to just even slow down some of the changes, this can give natural selection a chance to kind of keep up with the, the change level. Um, I also want to point out that there are a lot of really good success stories, that when humans have noticed that we're having a negative impact on certain populations or environments, um, some of our, um, our efforts have been really successful. So two success stories include the um, bald eagle, as well as wolves being re reintroduced um, to Yellowstone and other areas. So that's the end of Unit 7, which was Natural Selection, um, and the next unit is going to be Unit 8, Ecology.